Howdy, folks. Um, welcome to the last evening of PAXEC. Um, I am uh, meeting here with two folks. We're going we're gonna to talk about RF and Wi-Fi stuff. And uh, they just dropped in. There's also a bunch of people in the studio audience uh, here who are in the broadcast studio. And uh, I'm just going to remind them that the the way that we're doing things tonight, the kind of we're, we're being a little experimental, so we're dropping everybody into a Zoom meeting instead of a webinar, so we can shuffle people in and out. So uh, if you turn your camera on, you are going to be streamed out. So keep keep that keep that in mind. <laughs> um, let's kind of explain the background of where we're at and how we got here, because uh, um, I know that uh, zero. Um, I, it's really the first time we've we've met, and Noah, we've known each other on Facebook. I think it was Ken Williams that uh, that introduced us. You know, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna just switch us to a gallery view. Hold, hold on. We're gonna go over here, and we're gonna do this live. And I'm gonna switch this. I should really have that so I don't have to walk over there to do, do this anymore. But uh, this is Japan's oldest security conference, and we're doing it online. Um, as I was telling you guys this, a little bit of the history. So we got uh, sideswiped with the CanSec West conference and the lockdown in Vancouver happening at the same time. So in the meanwhile, I've been uh, looking for ways to try to fill the vacuum that was left by uh, the lack of the meeting stuff. And uh, this is the first real planned although it doesn't seem like it because it's been kind of messy it actually feels very much like uh some of the first conferences we used to ever throw good 20 18 years ago now and uh it's online we're everything is still a little bit experimental we're still figuring out how to make things go slowly but the basic goal that i had for this was uh to try to get excuses for people to interact and uh get more uh those kinds of things that you get in bars at a conference when people just talk to each other over random subjects um it was really i've been i've been a little bit of a digital conference whore <laughs> for the last uh, few weeks i've been the guy i've been going to all the events trying to figure out what'll work and what'll happen so my experiment was uh, with this conference because we had a couple of months to plan it even though it was still compressed still rushed we should have done this so six months or a year ago now, actually. We should start working on virtual conference for Japan for next year at this time. But uh, we had a chance to not actually be so panicked about this one. So the idea here was a conscious experiment. I noticed uh, most of the online conferences are degenerating to what I call security Netflix. Everybody just kind of watches presentation videos after the fact and, uh, yeah. You know, there's no real excuse for people to interact. The one real exception to that, I've seen a couple of exceptions. That's a few things that uh, kind of made folks really start to talk and, and interact. One was a, a session at uh, Tour Camp online, which where everybody was editing. Uh, they had some ANSI art. It was a session run by Scotland Simons, and it was... Uh, it was, it was absolutely awesome. Everybody was kind of collaboratively editing the Asaski art piece on a Twitch that was being streamed out on Twitch while everybody was hanging out in a Zoom and drinking and just generally chatting. And it actually turned, it was one of the few times I saw that sort of magic thing happen where people actually just started interacting and talking to each other. And so my idea for PAXEC, and so far I think it's been working, has been to just pick a couple of topics and throw some really smart guys in a room and... and you know, not that I'm putting myself in that category, but just pick some guys who know know some stuff in that uh, uh, in that area and kind of nerd out and geek out. And so far, we've had a session on AI that worked really well. A session which was like future prognostication by some fairly bright security industry business business leaders. And we had a brilliant session. I enjoyed tremendously last night with uh, uh, Adam Laurie and Iceman and the. Uh, and the whole bunch of folks on RFID, which was absolutely awesome. So I had uh, originally had the idea that one of the things that I see at conferences all the time is that people often have like a little five or 10 minute thing that'd be just absolutely awesome to present to folks. But 
every all the conferences are looking for an hour, so people have to either stretch that thing out for an hour or uh, or lump in a couple of topics, get a co-speaker, do kinds of things like that. But so the original idea was to set up a kind of SDR roundtable and have people just show cool projects and spend a little bit of time to, time uh, talking about stuff. And uh, I I contacted Noah. I think he was the first guy, and I I pinged around and I checked a couple of people. One of the things that I'm finding about online stuff, however, is that people, uh, because because there's no commitment to flying to a place, you know, it, it's much more uh, ephemeral. People kind of can come on. And indeed, I think that evidence today is that zero. I mean, we, we started talking about this this morning. So thank you for coming out here. And uh, lovely to meet both, lovely to meet both, both of you guys. My plan, you know, I was a couple of weeks ago, I thought, what do I do? I got I to gotta scramble. So I have done exactly zero preparation and rehearsal for my little segment here. So you just as a warning, you guys, I, I went downstairs. So I, I have, we call this place the Republic of Gadgetstan because I am a crazy gadget hound. Like, for instance, I was just shuttling around for two, two, uh, two hours ago and I found this. You know, let me give you a better shot of it. Let's punch up the desktop camera. So. This thing, what is this? And I have no idea what it is. I have two of them. It has an SMA plug on the end of it. But I don't know what it is. So I'll have to go figure that out. But I have I have oodles of gadgets. I actually have a, I spent the last two years building an RF lab. So I have a lot of spectrum analyzers, time domain modulation analyzers, uh, scopes that go up to, six gigahertz and probes that go up to six gigahertz and all kinds of other stuff downstairs, which is an ungodly holy mess in my the basement suite that I use as my office. Uh, the kitchen is basically the IC desoldering and electronics area, and the right next to it, right next to the fridge, is a couple of racks of spectrum analyzers and lots and lots of antenna plugs. But I've, dr I've dragged up a couple of spectrum analyzers, and I've actually still got to find one more little one. And my uh, plan tutorial was going to be how do you do spectrum analysis for less than n thousands of dollars? So uh, I was going to especially focus on LF and uh, and HF area. So that's what I was going to do. I don't know. I I, I I know that Noah's been playing around with a lot, bunch of radio song stuff, and he showed me some stuff. But I apologize. I, I it's it's kind of become a blur. I, I knew you had something cool, and I filed it under. He's got something really neat to show, and. Vaguely remember it was something with an SDR. Or what? I don't know if it was a Radio Sun stuff that we were playing. And um, Zero is I, I uh, participate in his Discord, so let's plug it right now for uh, uh, give us the plug. Woo! Yeah, so uh, we were running the Wireless Village a couple of years ago, and uh, this fine gentleman came up to me after the conference. He says, "So, uh, what do I do tomorrow? Like, where do you guys hang out?" And uh, I did not have a valid response for him. So immediately thereafter, we started a Discord server for just like-minded people that like radio technologies. And we just kind of started doing that. So I'll, I'll drop the links in the chat. But if you go to rfhackers.com, you can find a link to our Discord on the community page. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredibly friendly space where somebody knows whatever you're looking for or they're willing to explore it with you. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, doing that. It's it's super worth it. it. I hang out there, so it's awesome. Um, I've learned a lot. I've just from from hanging out there. It's a, it's a good space. So uh, uh, um, you can people who are watching this in a whole bunch of places. Actually, I need to double check that right now. Uh, the uh, <laughs> let's see if it's streamed on, on the main sequest.net page. There should be a uh, Discord embed applet that's going to the sequest.net Discord. So if uh, you find uh, in, in there's also a Wi-Fi channel that's linked off the PackSec page, but uh, you can find us there. And also, get, if you want to paste a link into there, please do. Um, so in the general, paste in the general channel in the Wi-Fi channel, and uh, those will show up on the website. Uh, I, I do feel the need to point out that. Uh, when we started the Wi-Fi village, it was a, a Wi-Fi village, right? And then a couple of years in, we kind of renamed it to Wireless Village, and nobody cared. 
everybody thinks wireless and Wi-Fi are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we had branched out into all kinds of other technologies and whatnot. Um, but now we've actually rebranded it again. So instead of having a wireless capture the flag, we have an RF capture the flag. So it's the RF CTF for radio frequency capture the flag, just to get the understanding that like Wi-Fi is cool. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I have 75 Wi-Fi cards plugged into my computer right now, but it's not the only thing that's plugged into that computer, right? There's eight Zigbee dongles. There's a bunch of SDRs. Like I like anything that doesn't physically touch something else, like just shooting uh, electromagnetic spectrum is super fun. So yeah, that's, that's what we do. We do all of the wireless stuff. If you want to talk about pagers or P25 or whatever, I'm, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> it's cool. And, uh, you know, so let's, let's all plug. So come, come join, join our discord and join the, the RF hackers discord. There's, they're starting out to become kind of cool communities. They're both small, not too noisy, not in chatty. And, uh, I think that, you know, it's the new, I discord's the new IRC. So, so, you know, that's kind of the background of how we got here. So let, let me explain to you a little bit of the philosophy too. So what we did is we took the conference and we kind of spread it out over four days. Normally we jam everything into eight days and we'd have back to back panels. So we're kind of being a little bit more chill with this, spreading them out and uh, trying not to overlap stuff. We did the Pone Tone competition and we, we had some panels overlapped and I'm not going to do that again next year. But so we're, we're, this is kind of a chill conference. We're, we're, we're spreading stuff out where this is supposed to be lockdown friendly. And uh, so this, I'm actually really looking forward to this chat because actually I have, I have a bunch of questions for you because I think you were, were you the person who was doing the oversampling on the Blade RFs on, in the SDR channel? Is that your trick? There that was my uh, Discord, and there are a couple of different ways to do it, and I am not the author of any of that, but I do know how it works, so we, we can definitely chat about it. Yeah, I, actually, I, 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 I do want to. <laughs> so, but, you know, before we, before we do that, I, I've babbled a lot, and they've given, I think we've gotten enough context here. Please take, take 10 minutes, tell us about yourselves, tell me, introduce yourselves to me and the people, wa and the people watching, and uh, give us sort of maybe a little bit of a preface of, of where we're going to go and talk about. So um, let's uh, let's go to Noah first. Go. Oh, rock on. Um, so I've been into uh, the information security realm since I was in high school. Um, but I've been interested in RF for longer. Uh, when I was a Cub Scout, we had a, a, storm, a storm chaser ham radio guy uh, give a presentation to us. And I was kind of hooked. Um, I was eight years old and I went to the FCC office and I sat through their, uh, through their training and I tried to learn Morse code and I kind of got it and I took the test and I passed the test and then I took the code test and I couldn't copy Morse code. I couldn't determine what they were transmitting via Morse code. My, my little eight year old ears just, it was, you know, they slowed it down to five words a minute. I just couldn't quite make sense of it. Um, so I kind of just gave, I, I just gave up. Um, I did some scanning as a kid, uh, you know, built a lot of uh, little telephone FM transmitter bugs and all sorts of other fun little projects. Uh, I finally got my ticket about 10 years ago. Um, so I've been a ham for about 10 years. But like I said, I've been into RF longer than I've been into uh, not quite computers, but almost as long as I've been into computers and longer than I've been uh, working in the security field. Um, so, uh, you know, when it, you know, Dragos came to me with, uh, with a vision of a chat, just a round table about um, SDR and I'm doing, uh, I'm doing all sorts of stuff with SDR. Um, you know, I took my scanning shenanigans to the next level uh, with SDR. So instead of having a little handheld scanner from Uniden or Radio Shack, um, you know, you've got just a little dongle that plugs into your smartphone or whatever, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, you know, the software does everything else, and um, even the cheapest of these can pick up, uh, you know, almost all the things you find on public safety, um, all of the AM, FM radios, well, not AM, but all the FM radio stations, um, you know, walkie-talkies, two-way radios, FRS, um, uh, a whole lot of ham radio frequencies. And so I was scanning, you know, I was like, uh, you know, I wonder what the Burger King headset uh, intercom thing is using. And I'd go and I'd find it. <laughs> uh, and so I've been, you know, messing around with that stuff. 
Um, and then Dragos mentioned the, uh, the radio songs. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, National Weather Service in the United States and a lot of other uh, weather services uh, across the globe send weather balloons up into the sky. Um, they hit over 100,000 feet usually um, or around 30 kilometers up in the air. And they just carry a payload. And the payload looks a lot like, not like this. It's just a little styrofoam box. Um, with some antennas and sensors and stuff hanging off of it. Um, a lot of these transmit GPS coordinates, and so, you know, those can be decoded. Uh, they're really weak transmitters, but since they're straight up in the sky, you've got line of sight, so you don't really need fancy. A, a little antenna um, and a software-defined radio dongle can, uh, can pick up the signal, or even your little handheld can pick up the signal. Um, and they're software to decode it. So, um, we just go out and listen and find out kind of where they're going to land. We've got some software that does predictions on, on where they're going to go based on the wind uh, near the surface and the wind aloft from previous radio songs. And, uh, you know, whenever one lands within 15, 20 miles of home, I load up the car and, uh, you know, fire up the Raspberry Pi that's got one of these in the decoding software, and I just go out and, and snag it from a cornfield. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've done that, um, and I'm also using some software to decode uh, public safety, trunks, digital voice. Um, even the local uh, state version of the FBI, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, uh, public safety, they all use this trunk system. Um, and so, you know, I can sit here and monitor the trunk um, and then hear pretty much every message that goes across in the clear. We've got a couple of municipalities that have gotten really, really heavy on encryption and we can't decrypt those legally. Um, you know, and you can't really decrypt it unless you have the key and I don't have any of the keys. But. That's really kind of what, uh, what I'm into right now for software-defined radio. Um, I can get into a lot of further details, but uh, why don't I go ahead and pass it off to Zero for a sec. Hi, I'm Zero. I'm known for red sunglasses, which I don't have to wear in my house because despite the fact that it looks reasonably well lit, it is not. It is, it is really dark here, and the only light in this room is behind me. So I can wear my yellow glasses in, in this room. Uh, so I've been doing wireless stuff for a long, long time, mostly just because I get bored easily, and this is how I kill time. <laughs> I started quite similarly, actually, right? Um, I started with scanners and ham radio, and I similarly was awful at CW and got my ticket about 10 years ago. I actually just renewed it uh, last month, so it, it's like, yeah, 10, 10 years in a month is how long I've had my ham radio license. Uh, at the same time, I also liked low-level networking. Uh, I worked on the EdderCat project back in the day, doing uh, art games and sniffing on switches and that kind of stuff. Um, just really liked both of those things. And so I never really grew out of any of that. So I do low-level networking, especially of the wireless variety. And once I've got an IP address, I say, cool, I'm on the network. It's your problem, dude and pass it off to the next guy up the stack who doesn't know how networks work, right? So I, I do a lot of weird uh, wireless stuff, a lot of weird low-level networking stuff, uh, and then I do a lot of Linux stuff. So I have my own Linux distribution. It's called Pen2 Linux. Uh, it existed before Kali, and, and it'll exist after Kali's gone. Uh, <laughs> but I do a lot of Linux stuff and a lot of SDR stuff on Linux, so making sure that all the SDR tools work making sure all the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth tools work, because that's what I do day in and day out, right, is making sure that, that I can use these tools because I want them to work. So uh, I spend a lot of time making tools work, and uh, then I pick which tools I like to play with, and I start playing with those. So I've tried, like, every software decoder that, you know, decodes radio, and some of them are awful, and some of them are somewhat usable. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I spend all of my free time. I also uh, do, similar to you, uh, just wanted to put a bunch of SDRs together and things like that. So I also work with a couple of friends and build weird stuff. 
So, for example, been uh, working on a 12-way splitter that splits from zero megahertz to seven gigahertz. Uh, you can't have this yet because it's totally a prototype and it totally doesn't work the way I wish it would. Uh, right now, it works up to about 4.2 gigahertz very reliably, and it works up to about five gigahertz pretty reliably. And we're working on working out those bugs so that we can run it from basically zero megahertz up to seven gigahertz or so. Uh, that gives you the ability to plug not just your software defined radios, but your Wi Fi cards in there, and you can do Bluetooth. And you can even do like wideband spectrum analyzers. Uh, for example, a lot of people chase radio sons with um, the Mayhem firmware for the Porta Pack. You, you've got the decoder right on there. You've got a handheld, basically a large Game Boy kind of a setup. And then you can go chasing the sons. And that is super, super cool because, uh, again, it's a little Game Boy and you get to chase something that fell out of the sky. It's just, okay, maybe I'm weird, but that's awesome, right? <laughs> you get to do that and it's super fun. So um, yeah, setting up weird base stations to monitor literally everything, setting up weird handhelds to monitor things. Um, I also worked on the Pwn Pad and the Pwn Phone. Uh, before that, I worked on the Sharp Zaris. For those of you that are old enough to remember cool PDAs, this is a Japanese conference, right? So everybody has to have a Sharp Zaris at home. Uh, still one of my favorite pieces of equipment, right? Just, just super love that. But yeah, nerd. Credit established, I think. I'm bored. <laughs> Let's get some radios out. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, uh, I never had those artists, but I have a couple of functional uh, HP Jornada, uh, like little mini um, ARM palm tops. Uh, some of them are yeah. still running the current version of NetBSD just fine. Uh, they, they make interesting crash carts and you know, note-taking devices, but yeah. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I, I would love to get the Hack, hack RF and Porta Pack. I just built my own Radio Sans chasing thing with uh, a Harbor Freight knockoff Pelican case, a Raspberry Pi, and a 3.2 inch uh, touchscreen. And I was just like, whatever, it's good enough, ship it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's. Oh, when you drive around in your car, that's totally great. Like, that, yeah. that's an awesome setup. Yeah, and it works in the field. I mean, it's 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 a little case that's like this big. Um, you know, it's gotten a bit. It's got a big USB battery inside and a fan, um, and all of that. It works pretty good in the field too. But uh, it's definitely not nearly as elegant or portable as the as the uh, Porta Pack. Did you use one of the yeah. pre-made kits for the for the Pelican case? Because I know there's a couple of those that are available. You just so bought I the Pelican case and... The hole and the cutoff wheel and. Uh, made a huge mess of the pick apart foam that's inside and my cats loved every second of it. They're like, we're going to chase every last one of these to every single corner of your home and you will never find them all. So yeah, it was fun. Um, I wish I had a double sided Velcro. Yeah. I wish I had a Velcro. Like Friday and uh, they haven't gotten it back to me yet. But it's a cool, cool little project. Sorry, yeah, the software for Porta Pack is uh, pretty pretty early stage yet. So the like Radio Sond Auto RX or whatever that software is is definitely a lot more mature. Does it have support for the sixteen eighty Sonds or is it just the four hundred right now? They have theoretical support for several different ones, but I live let's call it very close to a weather station that launches them every day, and it doesn't pick up anything <laughs> for me. So, yeah, it, it's early stage software. The guy's working on it over in Europe. So whatever the, the setup they use clearly works, but it's, it's not the same as the one here on the East Coast. Sorry, we're just, I'm just, uh, somebody, my coast host dropped off, so I have to make him <laughs> a co-host again here. It, bring some more folks in the broadcast studio here. Trying to juggle too many things. Sorry, I had to drop off there too. We had to hand off. Uh, I'm, I'm trying this new setup where we put everybody in breakout rooms so that people who uh, who come in for the next session aren't left sitting there waiting for another webinar to start because Zoom only lets you start one webinar at a time. So uh, we're being being very experimental here, and uh, we'll see we'll see how it works. But my co-host is back, and we've got a bunch of other people that have joined our studio audience here. Um, 
Porta Pack to get back on track. Mickey Shack. Mickey Shaktov has been so, uh, trying to convince I'm me to buy to one. Session. I'm sitting there waiting for another webinar oh. to start because Zoom only oh. lets you start one webinar. Oh. Hi, Hugo. Hugo. Uh, Hi, Hugo. Being, being very experimental <laughs> here. Um, uh, but we're going to we're gonna mute Hugo because <laughs> cause he's echoing. I don't know if he actually knows he has guys got his video on, but uh, that's cool. It's better that way. <laughs> More than Mary. Oh, Absolutely. So that this this is supposed to be social. I mean, I'm I'm. It's the idea here is to get people to interact, and these panels are, roughly speaking, an excuse, an excuse for uh, to get a bunch of people to talk and uh, and get people to interact. And we're going to streaming them out because we want more people to do it. So I was going on about the Porta Pack, which I don't have one, and that's one of the things. We, I'm actually ashamed of this because my my. My gadget stanny citizenship is being in threatened to be revoked because this is an SDR I do not have. So um, uh, um, let's see where we where we going this. Oh, you go. We 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 can there. play which SDR should I buy? That's always my favorite game. I, I I know the answer. It's this one right here. I have it in my hand. Oh no no sir, that is not the answer. Why not? <laughs> Is this is this a paid advertisement? You guys didn't tell me we we're getting paid. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But, but they are my <laughs> hey, so they are my friends. So they came out and they spoke when I threw a conference in Amsterdam. Oh God, like eight years ago now. Uh, they came, they came out and spoke, and they, they were, this is before they were doing the XTRX. They were doing their previous board, and I'm trying to remember exactly what. But, but anyway, they were nice guys, uh, so I would plug them no problem. But why is this raw? But for the folks out there, this is called an XTRX. Uh, and it's just, I think it's a cool SDR because it's micro PCI, uh, PCI based and everybody was ribbing me because I made a mistake and called it PCMCIA yesterday. So, oh. Uh, oh, we're old, know, okay, but, we're old. But, but you know, F, F that because, because basically at the protocol level, it's still that same old ISA protocol, PCI and all those all you can trace their their origins back to there so it's just a newer more modernized version that runs faster with a whole bunch of packety stuff and other buses thrown in and other things if you say it's but, card bus i'd let it slide but pcmcia isa and pci are too different i can't let that one go okay. that's, that's like sata versus pata they're they're different at a, a fundamental level but anyway okay but, but cool the shared radio. lineage anyway anyway yeah yeah so what's your favorite sdr <laughs> Let's play. What's your favorite SDR? First of all, I was just ribbing. That is an awesome SDR. By all means, that is a great SDR. The the no, correct I, I, answer I use it. Okay, it is okay. Yeah, the, the correct answer is not the most expensive one you can buy, but the most expensive one you can probably afford for what you want to do. My favorite, honestly, are these these Nuelec RTL SDRs. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have them. Yeah, most of us have like a stack of these things. This mm -hmm. one happens to be the one that's uh, hacked for bias T, so it gives power out the uh, antenna port. But these are like 30 bucks. That's okay. twice what the cheap ones are, but they have a much more stable oscillator, which means that as they heat up, they stay on frequency much better. So when you say, I want to tune to 460 megahertz, it's actually 460 megahertz, right? So these have a really good oscillator. It's actually better than the one that comes in like the hack RF standard, for example. So they're they're really good piece of hardware and they're 30 bucks. So if you're not sure if you love SDR or not, buy this and find out. Because for 30 bucks, how can you go wrong? Right? You buy something like that, or even the cheaper ones, if that's more your price point, 15 bucks to find out if you like SDR or not. It's not like sniffing Wi-Fi, right? You know what to flip thing in a monitor mode, start getting packets. It's a very different beast. So totally start with the RTLs. So how, on that on that front, how would you compare that to uh, a couple of the Nano 3s? And then I've got the uh, RTL SDR blog V3. Um, how would you compare those two? Because I actually don't have the uh, straight up uh, Nano SDR smarter. So... The V3s are great. The problem is, is they are super, super, um, mine broke. I haven't got a lot of them. I had one and it worked fine and I had no complaints and then it broke and I never got a chance to test it competitively against like the other ones. 
but they're super popular. They've got like the right specs. The main thing to look for for an RTL is to see if it has that upgraded TXCO, temperature controlled crystal op uh, oscillator. It's just the thing that makes sure the frequency you set is correct. And as the unit heats up, it doesn't drift. So like the plastic one that you showed first, for example, those are the cheap ones. I've got a stack of those too. Love them, but they heat up and they drift and the oscillator on them is garbage. And buying the RTL um, blog one or buying the, the new elect one, they drift a lot less. They get to a stable point much faster. They stay stable much faster. Um, the big ones versus the nanos for the new Alex. Uh, new Alex got like a super tiny one too. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of those. Yeah, don't don't touch those. No, ever. they get very hot. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're insanely hot. I put double heat sinks on them and they're still just hot as hell. They work. They work fine. They're nice. And I keep one in like a little headphone case in my go bag so that I have something to connect to my cell phone when I want to do something stupid at like a con. Uh, let's say I go to a concert and I see that the mic is wireless. I'm bored. You know, I like to remix the con uh, concert to my own likings. You know, usually I like a little more violin or a little more vocal, so I can just fix that, right? Um, the small ones are great for that kind of thing. Just for the love of God, don't touch them. Like, do not touch them. I can't stress that enough. It's it's a bad idea. <laughs> but yeah, there's a bunch of different RTLs and, and totally start there. That is the right place to start. Past that, it starts to become how much money am I going to throw into this hobby? right? I strongly recommend you get to know this hobby before you start buying that kind of stuff. But once you do, it all depends on what you want to do, right? So I totally supported HackRF like from the start. And from day one, these things are absolutely freaking incredibly fun toys. This is one of the worst SDRs I own. But it's also the only SDR that goes to like seven gigahertz, right? This thing does basically zero megahertz up to 7.25 gigahertz. It's an insanely wide range. It can rip through the whole thing in about a second and give you a, a, a waterfall for the whole seven gigahertz of spectrum that it can view. It's, it's not the most sensitive radio, as, as in the RTLs quite often are more sensitive radios than the HackRF. But the ability to do such a wide frequency range and to be able to, you know, run something like the Porta Pack, which just does all the decoding in this, this handy dandy large iPod size, is just it's super convenient, right? Uh, if if it supports what you want to do, it's awesome. So we do for for our capture the flag, we do a lot of um, fox hunting. So we'll have a transmitter and it'll be beaconing out something on some frequency and you have to go find it. Walking around with your laptop at DEF CON, your back gets super tired. This is not a fun game at all. And you can totally get like a cell phone app for, for Android and you can do it like that. And you can do basically what the HackRF and PortaPak does for, uh, I think the app is officially free and you can buy it if you want to support the team. Um, the spectrum analyzer from uh, Mance or something. Uh, but you can you can have a fifteen dollar dongle connected to your phone, and you can do basically the same thing. Or you can have one of these. Um, the main difference is the HackRF can actually transmit, right? So you can transmit, and it's an enormous frequency range. Whereas the the RTL SDR is, is much narrower. RTL SDR is like uh, thirty to one point seven on the most common chipsets. Uh, so zero to seven gigahertz is obviously a, a huge difference, right? Yeah. So the, the HackRF's awesome. Big, big fan. Second There's to the HackRF. Oh, wait, I Jewel. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, have you seen this? This is the bang for the buck. I think this is a good one for a beginner. SDR plays are well play. rated, especially for the HF range and stuff like that. Getting in the they're, lower AM frequencies. Yeah, they don't they don't have a good tie. They don't have a lot of high frequency range, but it's a good power. And the thing is cheap. It's literally very very cheap. It's for for, for bang for the buck. I think it's a great beginner SDR. So those are like a hundred dollars, right? Yeah, a hundred bucks. Yeah. 
And for yes. HF, that's incredible, right? If you're a ham radio yeah, person yeah. and you get an HF capable radio for a hundred bucks, you stole yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, if, 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 if you want to talk about fox hunting, I'll go get my, I've got a big H-shaped fox hunting antenna with a dis discriminatory circuit and all that classic stuff downstairs. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to go rummage through my antenna bin right now. So, well, Mine's on the shelf behind me. <laughs> oh, some of, them yeah, are, of mine are on the roof. <laughs> exactly. Attic. Uh, for fox hunting, um, a couple of friends of mine uh, are using the Kerberos SDR. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, so it's got four SDRs, uh, all clock synced, and it can actually use all four antennas uh, to. Ooh, I want. I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to see this. Oh, that's, that's yeah. It right. looks like this. Yeah. So it's basically, it's, literally, it's four RTL SDRs shoved okay. on oh, the I see. board. And the important part isn't that they are, you know, all plug in on one thing. The important part is it actually has the clock shared between them so they're all perfectly in sync all the time so you can do things like set one and then the next one and then the next one and then the next one you can make it four times bigger spectrum so these things do 2.4 megahertz and you can make it you know four times 2.4 or you can run them all in the same frequency but set them a correct distance apart a quarter wavelength apart and you can start to do direction finding based on angle of arrival, mm. which it actually is telling you based on which, you know, it's sampling 2.4 million times a second. It's going to say based on which sample, which radio got hit first. And it can that's, use that that's to figure sexy. out what it hit you on. Yeah. yeah that's, that's sexy. For our box hunts. And um, yeah. I don't have one of those yet. But, um, and, and the thing is, is that all the soft, there's, there's a couple of software packages that have already, they're open source for it. Um, and you can do it, you know, it really amps up the, uh, like the, you can use the passive radar, uh, like tune to mm -hmm. a pilot frequency for one of your, uh, um, HDTV channels. And so I, I can do the passive radar, but it can do the direction finding with the passive radar. So you get angle and distance, right? That's cool. I didn't mean to cut you off, by the way. I apologize, Zero. You were telling you, yeah, I, I do. I'm actually fascinated to hear what your list of uh, of good SDRs is because uh, no, it's, it's all good. And this, you keep this going. is also where you, you you see the difference between like how people are using things, right? I don't do a lot of HF work, so I don't actually have an SDR play. I'm familiar with the specs, and and I, it's definitely a great piece of kit. It's just I don't personally do that, right? So the next one on my list is probably the Nuon Blade RF uh, mm. version two. This is yep. basically Edis's uh, B200 Mini's little brother, except it's got multiple in, multiple out. It's got more uh, input and more output, and it's um, quite a bit cheaper. Uh, they also sell uh, Bias T powered uh, antenna port power uh, amplifiers for both transmitting and receiving. So for the wireless village, we've been using these for our our transmissions, so we can blast out at like darn near a watt of whatever we want. So you know, DefCon keeps big, giving us bigger and bigger spaces, and if people aren't close enough, the game's no fun because they can't pick up the weaker signals that we use to broadcast. With this, that has not been an issue at all, and the frequency set is super wide, and the quality on these things is absolutely amazing right up until you get to Edis's quality and Edis basically makes the best of the best of software defined radio everything. Right. I started with HS radio and like they're quite nice. Uh, at some point one of a friend of mine were uh, that's disregarded that but uh, he was buying a lot of uh, HS stuff on eBay that was like broken. Uh, <laughs> got that for really cheap and we quickly like fixed them. You can get like nice. some really really cheap Edis and it just was I, pretty much a pioneer in the SDR, in my opinion. Yeah, actually, I own a USRP one. Actually, it's uh, it's still still good. But hey, so while we're talking, what about the Lime? So, Lime is not my favorite option for a lot of reasons. Uh, the biggest one is reliability. They're mm -hmm. they're spec wise really good radios but they have had a lot of really weird bugs that cause a lot of really weird problems. 
their their software is not great. Their hardware has weird hardware bugs. Uh, mm. Some of them take so. For example, they're they're based on the Blade RF models. Yeah, it's they, it's, it's it's the same chipset, right? It's the same as the original Blade RF. It's not yeah, the same. Just, yeah, the Blade, yeah, 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 yeah. But so that they both uh, nuance planned to take extra power so you could push out, you know, larger amplifiers and things powered off the antenna ports. So to do that, they needed a more reliable source than the USB would provide. Um, when Lime copied the board, they forgot a couple of things. And so if you plug in the, uh, the DC barrel in the wrong order from the USB port, it fries the whole thing. Really? Um, I don't know if that is still a problem, but it was a problem originally. I, I actually out. So I, I'm, I'm guilty of, I'm guilty of, I have one somewhere. Actually, I have two somewhere, and I don't know where right now. I don't, they don't get a lot of love around here, unfortunately. So I yeah. can't really comment either, either way. Um, but they're, uh, they're better now, as far as I understand it. Like that was an early problem. But like, why buy the clone when you can buy the, the real one, right? The, so. The line basically running the same firmware as the Blade RF, why not just get the Blade RF and get the... Uh, my, my, my answer to that would be the Lime Mini because I like it for yeah. the... So I, let, me, let me see. I, I think it's actually within reach of here. It's, if I'm doing right, it should be right here. What is it? No, it's... Oh yeah, it's have a, yeah, the Lime Mini is definitely yeah. a different product. Those are pretty cool looking. Um, that goes back to my hatred of uh, some of the software around that stuff. I just don't like their software interfaces yeah. and drives yeah. me nuts. That is pretty though. The form factor on those is hard to beat because they're actually transmit and receive and all the cell software, if you're interested in doing cell stuff, actually supports those. So if you're interested in cell stuff and you're looking for as cheap as possible, Lime is definitely a great starting point for that. I like your case it's pretty yeah so i, I don't i don't remember this might have been like a spe this might have been a kickstarter special i think i was uh i participated in the kickstarter and this they only gave this and like this is one of their like early reward things for the kickstarter it's pretty cool actually I, this one's been okay i mean i would say use it with that one for a while and it's, it's i it hasn't gotten any any love lately this of, of late come on what where yeah, buttons but those are yeah. newer design. I, I don't. I don't think they have the same hardware failures. The uh, the aluminum cases for them definitely make a difference because they do get hot. Yeah, they do. They yeah, do, they all, all of this stuff gets hot. Don't get me wrong. This is not a, a specific against lime. The aluminum case oh. is an aluminum case for a reason, and it's not just mm -hmm. to try to block spurious signals. It's because all of this stuff gets hot, and you want it. So, uh, you want it stable. Right, so you want it to be dissipating heat at a reasonable rate, and you want it to not like have one spot on the chip that's super hot and the rest of it's cold. So having these these proper heat dissipation cases, even if it's hot, it keeps the frequency stable because it keeps the temperature stable, and that makes a big difference in the equipment. A lot of my stuff in plastic cases does not enjoy life. They mm -hmm. normally get individually heat synced or something like that if they don't have an aluminum case. Yeah, so my cheap SDRs, um, they usually get relegated to just using uh, NTQRX or SDR Touch. SDR Touch is one of those Android softwares that gives you a nice waterfall. It's nice if you can see the signal you want to lock onto, and you don't really care if it's off by, um, you know, 1.8 kilohertz or something absolutely preposterous like that. You, know, you just want to tune in and find it. And if you want to go hunt for it on an actual radio, uh, like your handheld ham radio or something later, it gets you close enough to figure out where it is. Um, but yeah, like, uh, like Zero was saying, the, the cheap ones, uh, they're okay for tuning, but they're, you know, if, if you're actually doing something that requires it to be stable, uh, radio songs being something like those things, the transmitters on these aren't even all that stable. I've got the board uh, out of one. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're not at all. These things drip a lot, uh, but they go up 30 kilometers into the air, right? So it's uh, well, well below freezing. Um, and so, and, and they do not have a temperature controlled oscillator. These things are built by the cheapest bidder. Uh, this is uh, made by Lucky Martin uh, Sipikin. 
Uh, yeah, and that's that's exactly why they drift, right? Is because the temperature is varying wildly, the oscillator varies wildly. You get the plastic dongle, and as it heats up, as you're using it, it's going to drift. So, yes. do you care? So, the answer is usually not. But when you set up a cool SDR trunk setup like you have, if you start it and it's on one frequency, and 20 minutes later it's a completely different frequency because the thing got hot, now you care. Right, yeah. my throw around ones, I don't care at all. The ones that are running all the time, you either have to heat them up and then tune it, or you have to just get the ones that are reasonably stable. Yeah. Um, uh, one cool thing, uh, a little off topic, but it's something that's pretty cool. Uh, these have an old, like, it looks like an ISA uh, card slot on it. Huh. Um, and uh, our group here. Kansas City, Stack KC, um, we built a board that snaps onto this, and we've actually completely reverse engineered the firmware on it. Um, and we've actually written custom firmware. And so we've got firmware that's like, it's still <laughs> super beta, but it actually turns this thing into a UHF papers beacon. So it actually goes to the ham radio uh, spectrum for us hams and it uses a protocol for transmitting TPS and location data. Um, and so it's actually just transmitting APRS beacons um, on the ham radio bands now. Um, with the, That's awesome. That's cool. Uh, so yeah, we're going awesome, to put right? amateur radio balloons up. And, you know, it just started as a, you know, we're all locked down. What can we do to get out of the house and not lose our damn mind staring at four walls? Um, well, let's go for a drive and let's chase some of these when they land in a cornfield or, uh, you know, up across the railroad tracks from me. Um, and then it got more and more involved. Um, and we actually have a Discord for SetKC. And a lot of our SetKC folks are hams. And a lot of those guys are on the wireless, uh, the wireless village Discord server. Um, but there was a couple of weekends where we were on Discord and we were in voice and video channels, and we were in OBS and sharing um, sharing microscope cameras over USB and sharing our, our webcams, <laughs> sharing our screens as we're in IDA Pro, pulling apart the firmware. Um, and it was super awesome to have uh, uh, you know three or four guys um, all collaboratively working on individual pieces. And I'm sitting here with my kind of lack of skill set in reverse engineering um identifying chips going and looking up uh data sheets uh finding the archive.org links so that if they go dead we aren't toast right um putting those in a wiki we're using patches resm uh uh reverse engineering wiki to document all this stuff we're using github for the uh, reverse engineering oh. and all that and all of that was just because a couple of nerds had some SDRs and, uh, you know, in the Discord server to dork around on. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That, that's the best kind of project, too, because, like, those radio sons cost real money, but nobody ever recovers them. <laughs> they just land oh, wherever. Like, some of them have a, have a you know, please return. Between his disposables, right? Yeah. Right? But uh, this one, like, you know, like, all, all the all the stuff here there's there's no return instructions there's no address yeah. some, some guy wrote Topeka National Weather Service right I mean like this this landed a couple of days ago 11 six yeah they're intended to be that's, that's a lot bigger than yeah I they're, they're supposed to be disposable but the point is is for a fifteen dollar radio and some free software you can chase these things in the cornfield and then reprogram them and send them back up and that's incredible. We are like totally that is a hobby. This is a this is a ST Micro um, cool. STM7. Uh, it's basically a flying dev board that, that falls down from the sky. Seven hundred and twenty of these fall down from the sky every. <laughs> anyway, lots of fun, and that's just one of the kind of cool things that we're doing. That's pretty awesome. Do you, do you also track yeah. other things in the sky? Do you track airplanes or, or yeah, ships in the ocean? A ADSB and... Um, uh, so uh, you've seen the sky sky circle spots, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so Actually, got, no, re refresh me. Okay, so um, a guy, I can't remember his name, um, in California set up, and I think it's over LA was his first one. 
It's called Sky Circles, uh, and it just looks for airplanes on ADS-B, and if they turn more than X degrees in X amount of time, then, hey, it's flying a circle. And then what it does is it calculates the arc and figures out what's at the center of that circle, and then it makes an announcement on Twitter. Hey, this aircraft, uh, tail number... That's killer, actually. That's really a good idea. 1200 and it's it's flying uh a circle that's three nautical mile radius around um irvine california's uh town hall or, or some some crap like that right mm-hmm. um so we've got a sky circles kc bot um run by my friend uh andy kc6 sss uh who just he runs a bot and, and his adsb listeners feed this bot and it just looks for circles and uh we've got a uh Operation, uh, um, gosh, which end, uh, is, uh, is one of those initiatives that's happening uh, all across the United States, but here in Kansas City as well. And they're taking organized crime and violent crime and investigating it. And so they'll find the Kansas City Police Department or Kansas Bureau of Investigation um, or uh, even uh, some uh, CIA hardware flying in the sky doing circles and we see it and we report it. Um, I don't have a whole lot to do with that other than just knowing the people that do it. And cool yeah, idea, I, though. ADSB wants no while, but yeah, we're doing ADSB and we're doing drones and we're doing all sorts of other fun stuff in the sky. Um, I will say this one that I just held up that had the writing on it. Um, I actually sent my drone out to do it. I've got a Mavic two and I just sent it. I was like, I'm not hiking through a harvested cornfield. I mean, it's harvested, right? I saw so, that you 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 found you found it. We had like an orange tag on it, and you scanned it for it with the drone, which was actually freaking awesome. Yeah, so is that what you did? It's it's got an orange parachute. That's I don't know. It's like two and a half feet in diameter. And so what I did is I just flew over the field looking for the the orange parachute that that it falls down from. And then when I found it, I was like, okay, let's bring her down to about twenty feet. And then I just walked towards my quadcopter, and there it was, right? So. That's cool. Yeah, a cool way to do it. Yeah. Awesome. To to go to go uh, full circle because I, I don't have a nice I, I don't have a nice uh, orderly plan or a list of topics here. This is very very free form. This is just uh, this is just us chatting. We're gonna go back. So I was, I'm gonna give you my biggest complaint about the RTL SDR. The frequency stability on it, even with thermal stuff aside is absolutely crap. Two of them tuned to the same frequency rarely equal the same frequencies. Like I've got calibrated and Ritsu and HP signal gens and, and then a Roden Schwartz SMIQ and all the other stuff in my, in my, in my RF lab. So we can do this. The other thing too is, I don't know, this is the other cool box that everybody always gets with the yeah. RTL SDR. And I'm not a fan. Everybody goes on about this, but like so i tried to do i I tried to use this to do spectrum analysis through this but this 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 deviates and is so non-linear on frequency it's absolutely brutal i've actually been meaning to do a quick set of videos to set a frequency sweep generator to just go through the sweep linearly and to show how non-linearly the result you get out of this out out of this is but uh that's I think the uh, uh, that stability is I think a big problem with a lot of these a lot of the a lot of stuff here if you're going to try to actually connect them to do two way transmissions with stuff that's that's where it really uh, starts to get a little little bit trickier and stuff so you know let me let me bounce my idea an idea off you guys because um, this is something I was going to do for our next conference actually so I, I've got a I've got a Ramsey RF isolation box downstairs. One of the things we 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 uh, we did for the phone to own contest. Whenever we had folks hacking the cell phones, we had a problem with everybody was worried about. Hey, what if somebody sniffs the exploit uh, they're they're doing before uh, before it's actually disclosed and we can't get zero days. Also, we did a lot of that in Japan, and in Japan they're a little little tense about regulatory stuff with RF a lot more than than here. Actually, we once we once got uh, wrapped. Actually, because our conference was using North American Wi-Fi jig gear set to channel 13, which is not allowed in Japan. You're only allowed to go up to channel 11 there. And we actually got in trouble from um, from somebody. One of the attendees noticed, and we got a notice from the Ministry of Communications that we must desist this activity and stuff like that. So anyway, 
got getting off track. So the idea here is I got our this RF enclosure box that we used to have for our uh, for our contest attempts. So my thought was to make SDR pong. So you you have teams of two people. You each get two SDRs inside this RF enclosure, and you have to transfer data between the two of them. And the uh, other team has to also transfer data, but you can either transfer data or interfere with the other team's transmission. So you can either do it offensive or defensively. So I was thinking either, either the teams get three SDRs or two SDRs in there, and they just get points, like score a basket every time they transmit a, a packet of data between each other. And uh, the one with the highest score at the end of at the end of the thing, the team with, that can actually transfer the most data and stop their opposing team for, from from uh, from transferring the most data wins. So that's my idea. Yeah, was, what do you think? What do you guys think about that? There was a major contest just like that, actually. Yeah, was there? Yeah, it, it, it was something to the effect of everybody had radios in the same space, and whoever transmitted the most data successfully through that space wins. So it was, a, it was a white space challenge to try to be able to most effectively use a congested frequency set. So it's, it's like, this mm. is where you're allowed to transmit in all these different tiny chunks, but all of you are allowed to do it. So good luck who gets the best throughput. But that's all you get here at RTC so in Canada on your ass. And I know from back in the But that's days, why you're... you're yeah. In a you're doing this in a box. In a Faraday cage, you know, you're doing this is this is your own. So the other thing, the other th the other subtlety here is, I thought if you have three guys, you have a chance, you have a choice to make because one of your guys can either go and start to scan and look for the other team's transmissions and start to interfere with them, and you can you have a choice of whether you play transmitter or whether you play offense uh, and or and or defense and scanner because you can you know so that's that's the, the you don't have actual white space. The other team gets to interfere with you. Is the other is the is the the difference in that's, this idea? That's what we so, call that capture the I, I flag. Know, <laughs> yeah, this is this is basically an RF capture the flag, but you know, it's you know red versus blue in 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 a box with SDRs was my we'll idea. So I, um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily advisable, but yeah. So we we replicate a bunch of different things. So we're transmitting out, and your goal as the contestant is to receive it. So whether it's pager traffic or you know radio traffic or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, it's your goal to receive it and decode it. But offense and defense are allowed, which means as soon as you decode it, your goal is to make sure nobody else can decode it. So we have all these teams that are doing really fantastic stuff, like Spectrum painting their team's logo over the signal every time we transmit it. Yeah, so you I've just get pick pretty cool. other team's logo. I love spectrum painting. I mean, that's, it's a horrible awesome. thing to do, but it's fun. <laughs> a friend so of mine we, to be so we did a that. competition. <laughs> Jonathan Anderson, uh, we, we did a competition for two years in a row at the PACSEC, uh, which is this year. Uh, we, it was called Capture the Signal, where basically uh, he had a series of... Uh, of steps of, of clues encoded in signals. And you had to decode the one clue before you get to the next one. And they started out really simple. Like the first one was FM encoded. And then then they then then you use it. One of the clues was the actual next frequency was spectrum painted in the waterfall. When the act you had to you had to look at the you had to decode the waterfall to read it to get to the next frequency in the in the challenge. It, it was it it kind of worked out really well. He's he's done that competition I think four times. And that was really fun, but I, 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 I'm, I'm still looking to try to do this offense versus defense thing. So if you guys are actually interested in doing something like that, I, I would love to pull together a competition. So I'm, I, I, for folks watching this, this is kind of an open call right now. I, I wanna, I wanna do something like this in around March. So if you guys, uh, if anyone's interested, ping me because that's that's the sort of uh, just an idea that I, that I had, but. So let's check and take a look at the time right now. So we're actually about uh, an hour, an hour and ten minutes uh, into, into all this. I know I, I, um, I actually have a, a had a little demo plan for you guys. I can, I can, I can do some of that. Do you guys have some demos? Do you? I mean, Noah, you had some stuff you wanted to show us. Um, so yeah, I didn't have a how whole. How do we? Lot how do we? I was doing some stuff with SDR trunk, which is uh, a pretty cool. 
uh, Java project that, like I said, it watches um, it, it watches Project Twenty Five channels. Um, so if if you want, I can just do a really quick and dirty run through. Go for it. Uh, go for it. You know, and, I, and I'm I, so what I was going to do is I have a couple of cheap spectrum analyzers. I was just kind of said log in another client and do it. And I don't know if Zero's got anything he wants to show us, but uh, we have we have a little bit of time and you know take. So you, if you share your screen, you basically get to take over this display here. So uh, if you you'll you yeah. you'll uh, if you want to share stuff on your screen, you can uh, take over the stream as it were. Let's see. I don't want to share my. And also, if you guys want to see what the stream looks like, we should should be able to see it at the sequest.net site. Yeah. Noah, do you need a minute to set up? Um, it shouldn't take me very long. Um. Uh, I'll, I'll share a, an anecdote then and, and give you a second to set up. Uh, I don't have any demos ready, but uh, one of my favorite pieces of software that we haven't talked about yet is actually called RTL 433. And what it does is it originally was for 433.92 uh, megahertz, which is where like just all of the unlicensed garbage goes in the United States. Uh, quite a lot of alarm system swamp. Uh, yeah, home alarm systems, uh, weather stations, uh, the clicker for your car. Basically, if it's, I it, if it's IoT from before people use the words IoT, it's 433.92 megahertz. So, like, I bought a whole bunch of crap sensors and strew them about my house. And RTL 43 tells me what temperature and humidity it is in every room of my house, right? Because why wouldn't you need that? You know, there, there's that cool thing on the wall that turns the heat up and down, but it only tells me that room, right? So I, I, I want to know what it is in the garage and my kids' rooms at night because, I mean, I don't have a because. It's just because I wanted to, right? But this is the coolest piece of software for starting off. One of the, like, the two demos I do when I'm like, you should try SDR. The first one is load up GQRX and decode wideband FM. That's the regular like broadcast FM. You get to see it in a pretty waterfall. You get to hear it. It's music. It's immediately identifiable. Might be good music, might be bad music, but you know that your equipment works and you know that it's doing something and it's cool. RTL433 is a decoder mostly for uh, on off keying, which is the da 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 kind of like CW sounding stuff. And all it does is, is it has a bunch of libraries for this transmitter looks like this, this transmitter looks like this, this transmitter looks like this, and here's the data they send. And so you can just load this up and just run RTL 433, and it will tell you if your neighbor has any of these sensors. It'll tell you when somebody clicks their Ford car keys and they had a model year from 1988 to 1995 or whatever it is that they decode. And it's just super, super fun to play with uh, because there's so much stuff that uses that. And despite the name, RTL-433, it actually is a generic demodulator for all of that type of stuff. So you can set it to 315, which is where like a lot of garage door openers are and a lot of other car clickers are there. Um, TPMS, Tire Pressure Monitoring System. Mm. So you can pick up when somebody drives by. So like I set up just a few SDRs using nothing but that software and it just streams data and... Um, Sometimes it's amazing, right? I freaked out one night because I left it running all night and there was a car every five minutes. Now, TPMS sensors are only supposed to transmit when, when you're driving. So why on earth was this car circling my block every five minutes all freaking night? And then I realized there was something wrong with my neighbor's TPMS sensors and he parked his car <laughs> at the end of his driveway instead of in his garage where he usually parks it. So it was just close enough that I was picking the thing up every time it chirped. And for some reason, when the car is stopped, it still chirps every five minutes. So it looked like this car was circling my house, but eventually I figured out that it was, you know, my neighbor. But, you know, building a silly home IDS that tells you this kind of stuff is just, again, there's no reason for this, but it's super fun to do. <laughs> do you, have you heard of uh, have you oh, heard you about go. any uh, IDS for like a uh, like? Is there any SDR project for IDS for like jamming and like that kind of stuff? There, there like isn't anything like... that I'm aware of. Um, there's a nice generic receiver set that's been built into Kismet. 
I, again, I, I came from Wi-Fi, so I'm super used to Kismet. But the new version of Kismet supports an enormous amount of stuff. It tracks mm. airplanes with ADS-B. It does RTL SDR stuff doing RTL 433, as well as um, it also does um, the ERT, the ITRON um, power meters. Like it'll do power meters and it does all kinds of other SDR stuff too. So um, it's a nice generic way to pick up a whole bunch of stuff. But I haven't seen a project that does like jamming detection, like for all kinds of jamming. There's some neat stuff I've seen for like, is somebody messing with GPS, which is super interesting mm -hmm. because the answer is usually yes, somebody is messing with GPS. Mm -hmm. um, especially like you get these wonderful notices from, from the military that say, you know, if you're within 90 miles of this spot on the East Coast today, um, it, it might we might be jamming GPS. You know, just let us know if you need us to stop. <laughs> like you can see where they're jamming it from and you can see what they're actually doing and whether they're jamming it or whether they're just tilting everything three degrees or whatever. Uh, it's it's neat to see when things are being messed with. And GPS is one of those things you just kind of the receivers can't detect this, right? Most of the receivers, the, the ones that cost less than like 10 grand can't detect this, but you can with a $15 SDR and that's nuts. And that's awesome. Mm. You know? <laughs> cool. That's super cool. Actually. I, I, I've, I've got to spend a little bit more, uh, more time with Kismet actually in the next little while. So yeah, it's been a little while since I've used uh, Kismet. Like it evolved a lot around the years. I've also like been like uh, big into Wi-Fi a long, long time ago. That's actually my project here for this thing is so uh, the XTRX uh, has an 80 megahertz bandwidth, and I want a device device that'll capture all the channels simultaneously. That's, been that's my just idea. one channel, yeah. not even that's half a channel. Wi-Fi is VHT 160 now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want to be one thing that yeah. I'm looking into. Yes, the new stuff. One thing I'm looking into as well is like using uh, SDR for like detecting bugs, and like there's different technologies yes. of bugs, but I, I didn't see much on that from like the open source like uh, SDR stuff. I, yeah, I the, the term the term is TSCM, Technical Surveillance Countermeasures, mm -hmm. and to to look for stuff. Um, and definitely like crap antennas or just a, a, an unfolded paper clip jammed in the antenna socket gently, but you can totally just jam a, a paper clip in there and, and walk around. I actually found that one of my monitors was uh, right on the uh, police across the river's uh, radio frequency, which, you know, it's weak enough that it's not going to bother them any, but it makes my listening very unpleasurable, right? So I, I figured that out and I swapped the power supply and lo and behold, I could listen to the police again, which is great. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of open source yeah, software you, for it. You just kind of have to, you know, do wide spectrum sweeps and oh. eyeball it. Yeah. Spectrum analysis, which is, I guess your guys are perfect straight man. Let me go get, a, let me go get some of the devices I was going to All show right, you. you get your toys and we bought no enough time to show us a cool demo, right? Yeah, so uh, for whatever reason, uh, Zoom does not want to share screen because I haven't granted it screen recording capabilities, but I have granted it to OBS. So uh, whatever, I'm going to hack this and we'll just use OBS to do this instead. So hopefully this is yeah, looks fine. reasonably okay. Um, so this is SDR trunk. This is a couple of builds old, um, but it's stable and I know it works and I like it. Um, the magic here, though, uh, with the latest alpha versions is it's got what they call a playlist editor. Um, and you've got this radio reference tab, which is super cool. I think um, I think most people that are here probably know radio reference. If not, radioreference.com has tons of information from uh, mostly the FCC, but I think they've got stuff from other countries' uh, regulatory uh, services as well. Uh, but you can go through and find trunk systems uh, with your fairly inexpensive uh, radio reference account. You do have to actually subscribe to it or at least know somebody that subscribes. Um, and it makes it very easy to import the control channels. 
you can manually hack in a control channel uh, for one of these, like I just called this one foo and hammered in a uh, P25 channel manually. Um, but the magic really happens when you play, uh, when you hit play and uh, it, it locks into your control channel, which is this right here, A53. Um, and your events will show all the things that happen. Now, it's got to be my luck. You're not going to hear anything because, uh, I don't know, it's, it's closing in on 1030 at night, so not a whole lot going on. But you can see there's a couple of uh, tuner unavailables, and this is because I only have one SDR plugged in right now. Um, what will happen is we've got this, this trunking system is very, very wide. It's got three different uh, frequency ch uh, chunks allocated to it. Um, and when you're using it on Mac or Windows, uh, as long as the audio channel is within the same waterfall as your control channel, it can pick it up and play the audio for it. Uh, but when the uh, frequency that it's trying to use falls outside of this waterfall that we're being displayed here, like these were 859, they just are too high up for this to see. Uh, so we get these tuner on the messages. Um, the other thing that it can do is, is pull in your uh, radio aliases. So every single call that comes in has a, um, has a trunk identifier, like which channel uh, they're, they're calling. And so here you can see it's uh, um, a St. John's Hospital emergency room, right? Um, at any rate, this is a pretty slick tool that automates a lot of the drudgery that you used to have to go through to uh, pick apart a trunked system. Uh, you used to have to either buy a, a unit in system. Oh, oh, there we go. We got a couple of uh, ambulance calls, I guess, going there. Um, they used to have to program in a lot of frequencies, and uh, it was a lot of effort to do it on a uh, handheld or base station trunk scanner. And this is just all automated now. Um, For, forget the effort. Um, the scanner to do this is between $450 and over a thousand versus yeah. I'm guessing your fifteen dollars in Java into this. Like that's that's incredible, right? The one thing I'll note though is that this is using um, all of this stuff on P25 is using I'm sorry, it's using a proprietary codec. Um, and the license for the codec is not free, it's not cheap. Uh, they want you to buy a hardware decoder because it's the easiest way for them to control it. Um, and so this does use a uh, developmental uh, education use only uh, decoder called uh, JBME, which is, uh, or JMBE, I think, um, which is a Java description of how um, AMBE might work or something like that. So this software does come with a little asterisk then you have to compile something really small to make it work. Um, but if it's for personal use only and you're not like uh, trying to publicly stream this uh, for profit or um, you know send it to one of the big apps that uh, does uh, um, like police scanner streams, uh, you're, you're probably not gonna get caught or anything like that. So. Uh, but it's just kind of a, uh, in certain jurisdictions, um, this is really kind of for uh, enrichment and education use. Anybody have questions about that? No? It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I'll post a link to this in the channel. I did post one in the very, it was one of the first messages in the SDR tools channel. I'll post a link to this in the channel though. Do you guys have your uh, radio amateur uh, license? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I definitely have uh, an amateur radio license. I think we may have covered that a little bit. Um, I've had mine for about a decade. Oh, sorry. Zero for about a decade too. I, I do not. I just do. I used to work for the division in HP that uh, made spectrum analyzers and did all kinds of that stuff for eight years. And it was uh, work more than a hobby for a long time. <laughs> uh, but uh, these days, it's more of a hobby than it's definitely uh, a little bit of both on, on some of that. 
I, I can't stress enough that when the police officer pulls you over for having 10 antennas on the top of your car, that the right answer to what are you doing, sir, is I'm an amateur radio operator. Because not only does that immediately clear up what's going on in their head, fact or fiction doesn't matter. They now know what's going on, but now they don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> so I mean, it's it's like saying I'm an insurance. Wow, 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 wow. Have never been spoken. It's 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 insane. Um, yeah, it's yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah, you're one of those guys with the with the ham hmm. and that's okay. With it. Yeah. The reason and I never so got my license was I never wanted to like agree to like all the additional like. You're informed about those law. You like you're registering. You have like it kind of feel like you're adding laws about like what you're doing with your radio. In, in the U.S., it actually exempts you from a large number of laws. Um, things like you're not allowed to listen to the police in your car uh, are are completely exempted for amateur radio operators. Don't ask me why. I mean, that's a weird there's thing. A, to exempt, there's a law that you can't listen to the police in your car, really. State I did not to know state. That. State to state. Oh, it interesting. In, uh, in like Indiana, it's illegal to have a scanner in your car that's capable of receiving uh, police. Like you can't have anything capable of receiving uh, police radio um, by various interpretations of the law. If you have like scanner radio app installed on your phone, you may be breaking the law in Indiana. Yeah, but amateur radio operators are allowed to have things in their car that can transmit on the police frequency. You're and allowed, allowed to, to have a like, big amplifier. Yeah, yeah you, you, can have a, you can have up to 1,500 watts uh, on certain pieces of the spectrum, including Wi-Fi. If yes, you, sir. Uh, and that's another fun thing that we're doing. Um, and it's not really SDR, but uh, we're doing mesh networking um, using modified like ubiquity hardware and we're going we're outside the actual Wi-Fi bands but we're very close we're adjacent to the Wi-Fi bands with some of that um, and yeah we can run eight watt I've, I've got eight and four watt amplifiers running all over the place uh, for those mesh nodes and it's totally legal so uh, what I'm setting up here is I, I've got a bunch of I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys join some other clients here let's we can we can do this with a couple of different ways. I can uh, cut this way and help this way. So uh, what we're looking at here is uh, let's cut this. So we've got I've got my my desktop here. We're going to try we're pointing camera at uh, this device, which is one of the cheapest spectrum analyzers that you can actually uh, actually buy. Let me go back here. So, oh, no, not not party robot robot. We got lots of robots. We got like, oh, this guy's, oh, this guy's off. My, I usually, there's a liar man robot too. But anyway, getting getting distracted. So this Thanks is, uh, yeah, this is this is one of the less expensive uh, spectrum analyzers you can buy. Let's go over here and do it this way because I think it's actually a little bit easier and visible. I can control the angle. So um, it's kind of cool. It's about four hundred bucks. So it's it's not so bad, but it goes up to six gigahertz. The problem with it is that it's got very slow sweep speed. Um, so we're you can you, it, it, keyboard, I think. Pardon me. I think we're staring at your keyboard. We're staring at my keyboard. Oops, hold on a second. Thanks for that. Let's try this. this. <laughs> Because I can see that. I, I I don't know why you guys couldn't see it. So um, it's got a fairly slow sweep speed. So it's got 250 milliseconds. So, so it takes. You can only scan the whole spectrum about four times a second. So that's not really useful for uh, for actual TSCM applications or if you're trying to find bugs. But if you're trying to figure out what if, what frequencies your iPhone is uh, putting out RF at, or if you're having that problem with the monitor, this is pretty pretty good uh, solution. So you can. Go and let's uh, change. We can reduce the span, so kind of zoom in on. Uh, it work. Uh, let's go for. Uh, it seems to have crashed. How interesting! No, no, it's it's working. Okay, so maybe your bug. You're just detecting it. <laughs> 
Yeah, or it's attacking your device. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, something Sorry. like that. Yeah, sure. Let's. Sorry. Try this one more time here. Trying to get get a good view. So I said this is completely unplanned. So if I if I would have planned this out, I would have. Uh, that's better without this light. I would have actually adjusted the lights in here. So it's it's not a bad device. Um, there's better ways to to do this stuff with SDRs, however. I mean, you you can get that SDR play. You can get waterfall displays on uh, on on an SDR. But the nice thing about this thing is it's a little self-contained gadget that uh, you can carry around. It's battery powered, and if you just want something quick to give you a quick indication of where in the spectrum what's what's going on, it's a small dedicated standalone device. But I'm going to show you guys a different device, which is probably not what you guys expected me to show you. So let's go back there and we'll see where, where's my Zoom meeting. Did we get hey, recognize that. That's a cell phone. So I'm going to get... I recognize me? that device. That's a cell phone, isn't it? Yes. Late 21st century, early 21st second, uh, century technology. Okay, we got some things here. And I'm going to turn off this video. We can, uh, oh, you know what? We can keep that one on. I'll just leave it on, and I'm just going to mute this. I wonder if he knows he's muted on all the devices that he has nearby. Uh, I'm pretty sure he doesn't. But this is gonna be fun while he tries to figure it out because he's not wearing the headphones. He likes to have a lot of camera on around. him uh, sometimes. There we go. Let's all just do this until he he sees us. By the way, uh, what is doing that? Uh, is there any question on the channel? I was in there. Not seeing anything. It's not right now, but I was like uh, proposing yeah. if anybody had questions. So over here, I've got this right. Why don't you turn this sideways? We see okay. swords. Yeah, it, that's his yes, this is, collection. This, welcome to uh, my my kind of living room. I, you'll see my collection of stormtrooper helmets up there, and uh, well, that's the other phone. Okay, so that's that one. Let's go down here. So down over here, I brought a whole bunch of devices. So I'm going to show you guys some spectrum analysis on this particular thing. Let's see if you can actually zoom it in. Hang on a little bit. Go down here. So I make this one go over here like this. So um, I'm going to show you guys how to use a uh, oscilloscope for as a spectrum analyzer because I'll see if this stem this demo works or if well. All right, it powers up. Sweet, I have battery. So I actually was going to show you a couple of spectrum analyzers here. So I brought, which I don't know if I'm actually going to set up for you, a beast of a thing here, which is uh, an actual real spectrum analyzer set, a test set, uh, an HP uh, 8591, the uh, workhorse that HP sold hundreds hundreds of thousands of in the in the 90s um this is an old cable tv spectrum analyzer set you can probably pick one of these up for about 700 bucks this you're basically paying uh for the bandwidth that you're going to be uh that, that you're going to be getting there so the, the more expensive ones expect you know if you want to go one, one that goes up to 30 gigahertz expect to be paying at least five to seven thousand dollars but we're talking about lower frequency stuff and surprisingly a lot of these actually kind of crap out at the low end. So when you start getting into into megahertz, they we can see your ass not, right now. Not well, good. You know so which camera you, you can use is these uh, oscilloscopes so often have a uh, Fourier analysis mode. I, I think you're, you're, you're playing to the wrong camera. Pardon me? Uh, we're currently watching the butt <laughs> camera. Wrong camera. So yeah. hold on a second. Yeah. I'm gonna turn <laughs> off the other one. Zoom is uh, 
ask. That's so fun. Go. Okay. That was the wrong one, I think. So, I don't know if you guys can hear. Let me turn up the volume on this thing too. So, <laughs> is the one speaker? Yeah, oh, we're we're on the camera to your left. You're on this one. Actually, you know what? Yeah. So the folks on the stream get to see all the cameras. So the stream right now looks like. Uh, here's what the stream looks like. This okay, is, this is what's going out on the screen specifically from this box. So, um, we gotta go to this, put this back, so, in, so back in here. To get you. Okay. So, I'm sorry, so it's just us with the fun view on the panel. Yeah, it's just us, but you know, if you want your Zutu Cal gallery view, you can get that too. So um, I'm going to show you how to, let me, I'm going to wait here and just figure out how I can fumble through this to figure out how to get to that uh, measurement mode again. So, horizontal trigger, utility. Uh, might have to go get another one of these. So the, the base point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, a lot of times, if you've got an oscilloscope, there's a much more useful tool. And if you've got an oscilloscope that goes up to 100 megahertz, or this one here goes up to 200, 250 megahertz, let's see if I can make this one go a little bit better, because I'm a little bit more familiar with this. So please turn on. Oh, good. And I think I brought, I did, I brought an adapter to connect antennas to it. Okay, here we are, actually this is, so on this particular one, you can just hit the FFT mode and oops, it will give you a, a, a spectrum analysis. And you know what, I just realized that I'm not gonna waste your time. I don't have these, I don't have anywhere near these ready, so I'll just kind of use these as props. And basically say that if you're gonna do spectrum analysis in the in the low, lower, lower frequencies, anything up to 100 megahertz, this is probably a better investment and a better tool to buy than an actual spectrum analyzer because this will give you all the other stuff that you get out of a normal oscilloscope and many other functions for your hardware lab. So it's another kind of cool way to get some low cost spectrum analysis. And, that basically was my the, the gist of my demo. So um, let me just grab all these back. And uh, well, I, I was hoping I, I uh, should have done a little bit better homework uh, and uh, set those up so that I can have some signal sources and things to, for you to display. But that was like my 10-minute uh, tutorial in uh, how, uh, how to do spectrum analysis on the cheap. So let's mute this mic. Mute this mic and turn on this video. Yeah, there's a lot of great uses for SDRs to try to kind of fake test equipment, right? You can use GQRX for a, a wideband spectrum analyzer or whatnot, but nothing, nothing does beat real hardware, right? A real spectrum analyzer you no. showed it's four hundred dollars for a reason and that reason is called filtering right it actually does have a bunch of spurious signals and interference birdies and that's worth it right that's super worth it uh they make uh what's called a tiny sa a tiny spectrum analyzer they're like less than 100 bucks but they also don't have the frequency range they only go up to i think 1.6 gigahertz something like that um there's, there's all kinds of cheaper test equipment. There's used test equipment to get real spectrum analyzers, real network analyzers, and, and that kind of stuff is totally, totally worth it. You can go on eBay. So one of the, I'm just gonna show you guys another one that, uh, this, is, this is starting to get a little bit more, more but, uh, 
Uh, you can also get something like this, which is a, a portable handheld, sort of more modern, 2010 vintage uh, spectrum analyzer. But you're gonna, you're probably looking to pay like two or three grand for that. So uh, this is this also this one. This one does not power on because it's been sitting in a suitcase since we last used it for our uh, SVR dojo. So. Um, Put that there. Actually, since you since you want, since, you, since I happen to have this here, here, let me go mute. Let me go mute this. I'll just show you guys this thing too. Um, here's another little cool doodad. This is a uh, speaking of bug hunting stuff. Oops, this is a kit with uh, a fast sweep receiver. This is looking for audio bugs. So uh, this is kind of a, a cool little bit, uh, big, the X sweeper, which is a, uh, a, a basically a, a rapid sweeping uh, analog radio with uh, a bunch of different antennas that come in a kit. And uh, this is what you'd use for more traditional kinds of bug hunting function stuff. So some toys and things and, uh, people amused and i think with that we're starting to run out of time we're hitting close to the two hour mark so i'm going to turn off some videos make some things go away and put on some headphones so i can hear you guys and uh thank you guys for an awesome chat yeah absolutely thanks for having us there's uh this is the thing that I like in conferences to start with, right? Just hanging out with people that like the same things I like and chatting about it. Mm -hmm, you, know? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, this is exactly it, it. But I had fun, and that's that's what's important. Basically, yeah, that's you know, uh, at this point, the the stream, the folks watching stream is that's 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 absolutely great, wonderful. But uh, the experience here was actually talking to you guys, and actually, the, I, I learned a few things. You had just a few cool things, and. Uh, I hope we get to, to chat again very soon. Yeah, but before tonight, I, I knew your name and I knew what Noah had done, but I apparently didn't even know his name. So as he went through uh, his introductions and started talking about the uh, the radio sound reprogramming, it's like, oh yeah, I know who you are now. Uh, so yeah, this, this is probably, awesome. You're probably familiar with a couple of the other folks in my, in my crew. Uh, and I'm not doing the reprogramming at all. We're just, uh, you know, but it, it came out of the set KC crowd. Uh, for that stuff, yeah. So, awesome. let's let's talk about one of the things that we I want to do is so we've got a this this gr a growing community of Discord servers that are kind of like vertically focused on a particular thing or a particular geography, like oh, your RF. And you know, so uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is trying to find a way to make common link channels and be a, you put linkages between the Discord servers. So on our Discord server, you see a set of tabs called WorldGate, and we're already planning a channel with the folks from AV Tokyo, which is a job, is basically like Kansas City security, but for Tokyo. So uh, it's a bunch of Japanese. So we're trying to get sort of these linkages and we're gonna set up a bots that mirror channels between them. So folks between the servers can get to talk to each other on these particularly uh, uh, sort of federated channels. So if you guys are interested in that, when we actually get that working, I'll ping you guys and we'll see about setting up. And if in any case, then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put, if you want, we'll put a we'll put a tab to you for a channel for your particular servers, and you can put uh, as much ads and announcements as you guys want because uh, it's really all about building community, right? I mean, this is this is this is why I do this to talk to you guys, to share experience, to learn things. You know, you you both have a, a wealth of experience. You know, I I I'm fairly broad in my interest. I go deep on a few things, especially in the RF area, but uh, I merely scratch the surface on a lot of this stuff. So I love talking to the folks this is this is one of the reasons why i i do this stuff so thank you guys for joining me any uh, any last questions or words before i uh nuke the streams I just want to agree stop you. recording for i just want to agree with you with how important the communities are right conferences like this that that set people up and get them to to see that there are other people that have your same weird proclivities i love rf i want to do this all the time or you know i love rfid or whatever it is right there are people out there and you got to find them, you know, 
uh, on the RFID stream, I'm sure they talked about their Discord server. It's amazing. On this one, I'm talking about mine. Yeah, um, yeah. Like there are people out there. It's just a matter of finding them. So yeah, find us, hang out, be friends. We we've been running our Discord server nonstop for two years, and people are bloody responsive. Like everyone's down to chat. Everybody's down to hack something new, and it's fun. It really is, and that's finding the other people that like to do your same weird thing is it's finding home. It really is. So I'm, I'm glad that, that I could be a part of that. Yeah. And discord is super slick for stuff like this. So I, I talked about uh, the Kansas city. Uh, channel. My chairs are cameras or fires open OBS and does, you know, these multi picture and picture frame things. Um, and we just hack and we talk, we talk and maybe none of us are talking or maybe we've got a groovy body in there putting on some background music, right? Uh, because nobody's talking, but you can see what people are up to and you can ask somebody a question. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's actually pretty important. Um, I like stuff like this where uh, Dragos Zero and I can just chill, right? And, but uh, it's, it's even funner when you've got five or six people. Um, maybe focused on uh, one project, but everybody's got their little niche that they're pretty good at, right? Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. totally make use of those video and voice channels um, on these Discord servers. Um, it's a blast. I mean, sometimes I'll just fire up my camera in the middle of the day on one of these Discord servers. Other people will do it. They'll just feel like I'm working with a couple of folks that I've seen once in a while. But um, while we're stranded here at home, uh, a lot of us working from home, like that sense of community and seeing other people and talking to other people, hearing another voice or seeing another face, even if it's not, uh, you know, a really nice gathering there in Tokyo this year. It's amazing. And uh, having something like that year round, um, we're setting ourselves up for a new normal. And that new normal doesn't necessarily have to suck. No. I, 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 this is, I, this is, things like this have been a real high point for me. I mean, the, the word that I always come back to is, is cheesy and overused marketing term, but synergy. When you get a whole bunch of people together, the sum is always better, bigger than the parts. You have this resonance that build up in the knowledge and people rip off each other. And it's, it's absolutely awesome. And on that note, gentlemen, thank you for making my evening wonderful. Thank you for providing information to the folks that are watching this. And uh, please, let's keep talking because uh, we're definitely the same kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. We'll compare antennas later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> I've got a bad antenna habit, bad, bad antenna habit. And also I've got a bad, bad habit with Russian, uh, Russian ham radio kits. I've got a box of them. I need to keep building downstairs, but we'll talk about that another time. Let's click off on the streams. Bye folks. Later.